Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Greater Tuscaloosa's Meet Your Legislators event. The University of Alabama Retirees Association, also known as TWARA, is a co-sponsor. Tonight, we are live on YouTube. Recordings of this event may not be used without the express written approval of the League. The League will only allow audio video of this event to be broadcast in its entirety, except by the media reporting on the event. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Kim, I'm sorry to interrupt uh -huh. you. There's yeah. a lag, and I'm not sure what it is. What does that mean? Do you hear your own voice still talking? No. I mean, there's always okay. a lag. There, there's, there's always a lag. That's how the okay. lag goes. Yeah. There's always a lag. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. There will All be right. a lag. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Start again. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. All right. So I think now we're ready to introduce the members of our delegation who are in attendance. I'm gonna put it back on gallery view for right now. Maybe, maybe I can, maybe I can't. No, no, no. There, all right. Okay, we have from the 63rd district, Representative Cynthia Almond. From the 70th district, Representative Chris England. From the 21st District, Senator Gerald Allen. From the 71st District, Representative A.J. McCampbell. And from the 16th District, Representative Kyle South. So thank you all for joining us and for bearing with us through our few little technical problems that we're having. Okay, so I thought tonight um, I would start with um, going around to each of you and asking you to choose one hot topic for this session. So if you had to pick one of your hot topic, what is it and why? I'm going to go back to gallery view because that's not working. Um, and I'm just going to go across as I see them. So Cynthia, I'm going to start with you. I know she's on her phone, so it's more difficult to manipulate. We'll go to Kyle, and then we'll go back to, to Cynthia. So, Kyle, if you had to pick one, what's your hot topic for this session? So, I think the overwhelming uh, theme of the session, unlike what we've experienced in the past, is going to be uh, uh, more of a focus on the budget uh, for the first time, definitely in my tenure. Uh, there is a significant surplus. Uh, in both budgets, along with ARPA funds that are yet to be allocated um, through through the the federal government, so uh, we're we're looking at you know uh, supplemental uh, budgets, you know, in in both sides, both the general fund and the education uh, trust fund, all totaling somewhere around uh, 3.8 billion dollars that we will allocate uh, additionally this year. Um, than than what we did last year. So uh, I think that's going to be the focus, how we use those dollars to invest in future uh, generations, because this is a, a generational one, one, once in a lifetime type opportunity, uh, and how we use those dollars for, for those investments and what that looks like for the future, uh, I think will be the, the, the biggest theme of the session. Okay. All right. Mr. McCampbell, what, what about you? I think probably um, I would say the charter school bill and the 
uh, the ag that was passed some years ago, that's going to be a hot topic this year because everybody is talking about critical race theory and all of these things that, uh, you know, these are issues that we're going to have to deal with. And uh, so I think that's going to be one. I have a bill. Uh, one of the things that's in that charter school bill uh, was to develop something to identify the bottom 6% of the schools in the state as failing schools. Uh, and the problem with that is that term failing has a negative connotation, not only when you're trying to um, encourage people to do better, but it also has a negative connotation when we are out trying to recruit industry to come to Alabama. So uh, we passed the Numeracy Act and the Literacy Act. And in those acts, uh, we described those schools that were not performing as, um, let's see, what is that term? I think it's, uh, the, I said the bottom 6% or the 94% uh, and the other term is, uh, unsupported and supported schools. So I have a bill, a couple of bills, and we can choose whichever one we like, but I like the supported and non-support, unsupported uh, schools terminology. So that bill will be, has already been pre-filed. Okay, excellent. All right, um, Senator Allen, what about you? What's your hot topic? For this session, I would think I would think falling behind uh, AJ and and a little bit about what Cal was speaking about about the budgets, but the one important uh, part of the whole uh, program in terms of recruiting industry is the Jobs Act. In other words, growing Alabama tax credit renewal if that's going to be in play. That's something that we've got to do because it, it sunsets in July. And uh, that's uh, the job back is the, is the state's main industry recruiting tool. And, uh, and that's important because we want to continue because we have done quite well. The governor and, uh, and the secretary Canfield has done extremely well and, uh, in recruiting industry. And we must uh, renew that uh, jobs act so we can continue. And, uh, and uh, of course, the Jobs Act is a performance-based tax incentive that provides income credits for qualified business people and companies and uh, based on new jobs and investments uh, created. So, so the Jobs Act is important because, uh, as you know, we have uh, seen uh, uh, companies come to Alabama simply because the incentive that we, we as a state has offered and for us to be able to do that, <clears throat> and then, of course, I think workforce development goes hand in hand with that as well. So those two items, in my opinion, are the, are the big ticket items for this state and for each of us to, to address in this session coming up. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, Representative Almond, are you ready? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I, I'm going to stay unmuted and... <laughs> And video on and I'll try to be quiet. So uh, when I looked the other day, there really weren't that many bills that had been pre-filed. So we're not exactly certain what is coming, but uh, one of the things I've heard about is school choice uh, in terms of hot topics. And I definitely think that will be, be one for us if it comes to us. And I think that it will. Uh, certainly some strong opinions um, for and against even um, you know, within the same party. So uh, it's, I think that should be an interesting debate. Okay, great. And Representative England, what's yours? I was gonna try to pick something that I don't ever talk about. Um, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, since everybody took all the good stuff, uh, obviously, you know, with all the changes um, in our um, criminal justice system, I think that's gonna be a big topic. Um, we. We've got some um, emerging 
crisis level issues to deal with in our criminal justice system. And I think you'll see several pieces of legislation introduced to deal with things like a, an aging expensive population in our prison system that is uh, taking away, is commanding a large amount of resources and making it difficult for us to manage that population. Um, I think you'll also see, a, a, quite frankly, a push in the opposite direction, for, you know, because of some things that happened recently. You know, I know you've all watched the, the, the prisoner release and how poorly that went. Um, so I think that's going to create some knee jerk reaction from some people about, you know, either slowing it down or stopping it. And you'll probably see some other things uh, that kind of push us in the opposite direction, dealing with class D felonies and trying to get rid of those or at least limit their use. Um, and also, uh, you've already seen a package introduced by the governor's office to deal with good time, uh, accruing good time while you're incarcerated. But also, uh, the attorney general has introduced a couple of bills, um, uh, both in the House and the Senate, to change the good time accrual calculation, which is basically uh, an inmate's ability to either accrue good time based on good behavior or to lose it based on bad behavior. Uh, so, again, I think you'll see a lot of discussion about the criminal justice system on both sides of the spectrum. Okay. All right. Excellent. Those are all excellent topics and a great way to get us started. Um, so, as you know, the league um, is all about voting and voting rights and access to voting. And that is a topic that we strongly um, advocate for. So, in this session, do you see any um, effort, any bills have been introduced or do you anticipate any bills coming that would advance voting rights in our state, um, such as expanding absentee voting, same day voter registration, those kinds of things? Um, and I'll start with um, Mr. McCampbell this time. I don't know why you want to start with me, because I don't see anything like that coming, period. <laughs> so I, I'll let everybody else chime in. <laughs> All right. Mr. South, what about you? Do you think we'll see anything like that? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of on the same page with AJ on that. I, you know, there there have been some minor, you know, uh, modifications here and there, but but I don't see any uh, major shift in how voting is done in the state uh, as, as we progress into this uh, session. I know there were a, a lot of voting bills uh, last session that that went more in the other direction than those that you mentioned. Uh, and and I, I think we'll see fewer of those this time, um, but, but I don't think there's going to be a big push to kind of structurally change the way we vote in the state. Okay. Um, does anyone else, does anyone else want to say anything about that? No. Yeah, let me, uh, let me, uh, there's going to be, I know two bills uh, in the Senate that deals with, uh, to uh, stay with the paper ballot mm. and, uh, Although it's it's a it's it's a rule already in the state as far as in the Secretary of State's office, but but it's not in the code. So uh, we're going to uh, see if that bill come up, and then at the same time you're going. I don't know the details on it, but there's going to be another piece that's uh, some way or another not uh, not uh, let our voting system be involved in electronics. Uh, and uh, transmitting uh, votes. And uh, so those two bills will be coming. Okay, good. That's good to know. All right. Um, let's move to education. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine two questions that I received. One was from Tuara, but it was very similar to another question I have. Um, and it's about the education trust fund for retirees that was created two years ago, but has yet to be funded. Um, do you have any updates on that? What is the, what are the prospects of that being funded? You 
talked about, Mr. South, you talked about the uh, budget surpluses that we have. Do you anticipate any of that money going towards that? Um, you know, that could be used as an um, incentive in recruitment and retention of teachers um, and in helping some teachers who just have a, to struggle with their retirement income paying for their, you know, a living wage, so to speak. Yeah, so um, I, I haven't heard any talk about using those dollars necessarily for that. Um, we, we talked about gaming legislation a couple of years ago, and in that conversation, uh, there was talk about a, a consistent revenue source to to fill that that need. Um, but but as far as dedicating a revenue stream going forward, which is what we would be looking for 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 something like that, rather than just shifting one-time monies over into there. Uh, I, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, conversations still being had, you know, uh, bonuses, those kinds of things, we, you know, uh, salary increases. But I, I think also as far as the recruitment of teachers, uh, there, there's a constant look and a bill or bills filed each and every year looking at tier one, tier two, you know, um, how, how modifications need to be made to that. Uh, in, in order to keep our teachers in the classroom a, as long as we can, keep good teachers around, but also uh, incentivize uh, young people to go and into the field. So um, it's a it's a constant, you know, look back and and how those things are done and how other states are doing it and and comparing ourselves and and meeting those goals to to give uh, give our educators the the you know every incentive to be in the classroom because it's not a not an easy job these days let me uh throw a couple of points in as on on kyle has brought up a very good point uh the uh, critical shortages of math and science and technology type instructors and teachers as you know we passed a piece of legislation last year that those individuals will can earn up to twenty thousand more dollars in the classroom, in which that has shown some very positive results. And uh, and as Kyle mentioned, trying to find new ways to to encourage uh, current uh, established teachers to continue their career in education. And uh, I think this is one method that we have done last last year to create this uh, $20,000 for those uh, science and technology and math teachers. And uh, so that's that's encouraging to see. And also uh, looking at the possibilities of principals and assistant principals getting a little bit better uh, pay, a, a, a salary increase, a scale will be established to, to figure out exactly how that's going to work, but uh, certainly to... Uh, uh, they created and tried to figure out how can we keep uh, current administrations and student teachers, classroom teachers, uh, to continue their career in education. That's critical for us. I might add, um, Sandra Allen and I were in an education trust fund budget hearing today, and. Um, this is my first. Um, this is my first meeting on on that committee, so I know uh, very little. But I will add that along those lines, what we heard today, Senator Allen, was that uh, for the first time, uh, we really do not have a shortage to, of math and science teachers uh, in in our state, thanks to the incentives that have been put in over the last few years. We have shortages in other areas, particularly uh, special education. Um, but um, we've made great progress in uh, getting those critical teachers in math and, and science. That's right. good news. So, well, yes, 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 one other item mm -hmm. I, I like to bring out is the uh, uh, resource officers in our uh, facilities, in our schools, and uh, that's something that we're going to really take a good look at and, you know, from a, a committee standpoint. And uh, for instance, like uh, uh, I'm gonna use uh, a county school system here. Uh, for instance, like um, 
uh, the Brookwood High School. Got Brookwood High School, Brookwood Middle, Brookwood Elementary, Vance Elementary, and Lakeview. And they have one resource officer. And the Custis County Commission pays for five of those resource officers. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the state uh, pays uh, and, and those other six. So we have a total of 11. And, and uh, <clears throat> I can tell you, for instance, like in other counties, uh, there's one or two counties that does not even have any resource officers for some reason or another, although the budget does fund uh, the, the superintendent's offices to be able to uh, have some form of fashion type of resource officers. So we're going to take a good hard look at this program because there's nothing more important than having uh, uh, an officer on campus and to making sure that not only our students, but our faculty and administrators are, are safe. And uh, that's, that's uh, a, in my opinion, that's a priority as well. So you're looking at putting specific funding in for that? In, in a adding, adding, uh, I, I, would, I would say, let's take a look, I'm going to look at, the, at the numbers and adding some more dollars to, to that because it's pretty obvious that it's not only a Tuscaloosa County issue, but it's a statewide issue as well. Okay. All right. So circling back a little bit to the um, education trust fund for retirees, if I understood what you said correctly, is you're looking for um, a revenue stream to continuously fund that, such as the lottery. Is that what you were saying? So you don't want to use any of the budget surplus because that could go away. It, it, it obviously we're we're looking further down the road, and those surpluses won't be there in in future years out. Um, next year may be a little bit different story, but a couple of years down the road, we're already seeing receipts kind of drop uh, within the state. Um, don't really know what to expect. So yes, we need a sustainable uh, funding source if we're going to go down that road. Um, and again, we we talked about certain pots of funds within gaming or the lottery or those kinds of things to to help you know contribute to to that type of account so uh i don't know where we will be on that topic and i'm sure it will come up tonight but uh well, that's good today. <laughs> we'll just jump right into that question because last year we did talk about that and um you all felt really strongly that um the lottery would come up, that it would be brought forth. Um, and so where are we on that? Who who wants to jump in on that topic? Because we've, this is, you know, every, I, well, I feel like every year, you know, we're kind of anticipating um, and it just never happens. So, so kind of where do we stand with that? Who wants to go first? Well, I could say this, and then I'll let Kyle take it from there. But uh, <laughs> last year, the House, correct me if I'm incorrect, uh, Kyle, but and others, but um, did pass a straight lottery uh, bill uh, late in the session and sent it to the Senate, and it did not make it out of the Senate. So we did get that far, as I recall. Uh, but um, as to what will come up this year, I'll let others speak to that. I mean, we, we, we sort of passed one, uh, you know, at, I mean, it almost caused a fist fight <laughs> uh, on that last, one of those last nights of the session. Um, <clears throat> but this is going to sound like, it's going to sound a little contradictory, but I'll explain it. Um, we're probably further away from passing a lottery bill, but I also think that we're closer in, 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 in reality, meaning and I don't think we'll pass something this session, but I think some of the external forces that used to be a rather large impediment to passing uh, gaming legislation uh, is in such a state of flux now that I, it might loosen up a little bit for uh, more negotiation. Um, um, with, uh, with, with what's going on with several uh, of formerly established facilities like in Greene County and in, in in Miles County or in Macon County, uh, 
you know, when those are in flux, like I said, um, it may create an opportunity for um, some negotiating. So I, I think that we probably won't see anything this session, but we'll probably have more fruitful conversations than we've ever had uh, in terms of gang legislation going forward and possibly see something before the next election, um, before we put something on the ballot, probably before the next election or, or at the next election. So I, I would agree with Chris uh, on that. I, I think we're we are further away, but there's more serious conversation going in and around gaming at this point. Um, and, and I, I think a lot of what plays into that is we've got 31 new members in the house. Uh, there's going to be a period of educating members, uh, and especially with uh, I, I, I don't, it. It's been hard for me to even wrap my mind around all the interests that come to the table when you start talking about gaming. And so it's it's not just as simple as a lottery. It's, you know, everybody wants to pile into that space. And uh, so, so I think that's the case. Um, I, I also think that nobody is in a huge hurry uh, because I don't think anybody has the appetite for a special election on that. And so the next time a general election comes around is two years from now. So we would have this year and next year to to get something put together that that maybe would be appealing to the voters of the state. OK, well, that, that's a good update. Does anybody else want to have any comment on that topic? OK, all right. Um. So kind of, so going back to education and this might um, have something to do with the budget surplus that you, you can discuss, but um, the, you know, Governor Ivey highlighted that students have decreased um, reading and math skills scores in those areas. Um, and so, what do you, what, if anything, do you see the legislature doing to support um, her efforts to improve students' abilities in reading and math? Is there funding for doing anything as well? That's what the Numeracy and the uh, Literacy Act uh, mm -hmm. were about, and those we, we did see some statistics. There is some movement, positive movement from the investments that we've made in those areas. So um, I do see the legislature continuing to uh, fund that, those areas because uh, the pandemic took us, you know, a year or two behind, put us a year or two behind. So um, yeah, I do see those those areas continuing to be funded uh, may even see some increase in those areas. And so would that include funding for the Alabama Reading Initiative? Uh, yes, that, that's the okay. Reading Initiative as well. Yeah. So, so I'd, like, I'd like to piggyback a little bit on, on AJ's comments there. So, so we made some very good strides, even in the national rankings. Um, but but I think some of those, uh, I mean, we, we want to pat ourselves on the back a little bit, but at the same time, we got to take a step back and look at the data as a whole. Uh, part of that in you know increase in in our scores was the fact that we stayed kind of the same during the pandemic while others fell off. So. Uh, you know, we, we want to set that bar higher, not against everybody else, but against ourselves and try to be the best. And uh, to AJ's point also, uh, even on, on the, uh, the math investments that we've made, some of that funding doesn't kick in until this year, this summer, um, kind of summer school type programs and those kinds of things don't kick in until this year. So there's increased funding that will come along with that. And uh, uh, we, we hope to continue on the kind of trajectory that we're on right now. Anyone else have a comment? Senator Allen, anybody? 
I'll just say in our. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Cynthia. I was just going to add in our education trust fund uh, hearing today. They they talked a good bit about that, and there are several documents that posted on uh, on on the website um, that people can go and look at and see the statistics for themselves. But they were were you know quite impressive that the gains that have been made. And again, not where we want to be, but um, but I think at least it looks like we're uh, headed in the right direction, which is good. And I would have to agree with that. And uh, I'm not real sure, Cal, you may be able to uh, help me with this, but two or three budget years ago, uh, for some reason or another, we did not fund the reading initiative like we should have. And we we are uh, paying a real huge penalty for that because it's plan, plan catch up. And, uh, and so I think it's right if there's going to be uh, a, a good solid uh, budget number to uh, sustain and keep moving the program forward. So that's, uh, you can look forward to uh, that to happen. Okay, good. All right, let's um, pivot to um, criminal justice. Representative England mentioned it as his hot topic. Um, and so, what uh, progress will the legislature pursue in this session to address the problems associated with the prison system? You know, what do you know anything specifically? Has anything been pre-filed? Um, do you know of any specific plans? And an additional question is, um, I'm wondering if any of you have visited a prison or ever attended a parole hearing? So you can kind of answer that as you go around too. And so, Representative England, I don't know if you'd like to start since that was your hot topic. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'll start here. Yes, I've visited a few prisons. Um, I visited Tutwiler. Um, I visited um, actually Ingram. I think we went as a group um, to, check, to check that out. Um, and I've also been to uh, a parole here. I've been to a few. Um, and <clears throat> I do think that we'll see some positive movement in trying to identify populations within our prison system that would be better served in other settings rather than inca being incarcerated. Um, like, as I mentioned earlier, there's a large growth, whether a population that's aging, um, sick, infirmed, uh, that are very expensive to take care of. Uh, and I think you, there has been a lot of positive discussions about uh, finding a better way to take care of those individuals. Um, I think it's, it's not a secret. We have, we're getting ready to, if the governor hasn't already signed a massive uh, prison healthcare contract with a company that used to be called Corizon, now it's called Yes Care, um, that actually was our, was Corizon was our previous to our current, Wexford was our previous healthcare provider um, that left us with a massive problem. Um, they left and we um, uh, went with Wexford and we haven't really seen much improvement, which is why we went with, uh, I guess, Yes Care. Um, but there's really no way to say that we're gonna pay a billion dollars over four years, knowing that um, the parole board doesn't really release anyone uh, people are getting older, they're getting sicker, and believe that by the time that four-year contract is up, with, with, uh, we're, that the rising cost of health care is not going to just create the same problem that we've had before, where it's just not enough money to take care of all those folks. Um, so we've got to figure out another way to do it. And uh, for me, I think the best way to do it is to find those folks that are again, better served outside the facility that are not a threat to public safety and put them in a situation where somebody else can take care of them and pay for it. Meanwhile, saving us money within the system where we can actually use it for rehabilitation, uh, re-socialization, um, and, and, and actually creating space within our system for people who really, really need it, who really need to be there. So uh, 
I do believe there's going to be some positive movement in that direction. Um, there's a lot of discussion in both the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle to, to try to figure out a way to do that. Um, I'm also have, have introduced several bills, um, pre-filed several bills to deal with different components of our criminal justice system. Um, one that tries to create oversight for, uh, oversight for the parole board. Um, uh, you know, just as a, a, a casual observer, regardless of what side of the, the aisle you're on, you can look at that and say that it is not working as it should. Um, just recently, for example, a 71-year-old woman uh, who's on dialysis three times a week, who's in a wheelchair, um, went before the parole and who is not a threat to public safety, who's been in over 20 years, who had people willing to take care of her, uh, the parole board denied her application and then set it off for five years. So she's either going to die in prison or she's going to serve five more years and we're going to pay for every single bit of her health care. Um, again, that's taking away a spot from somebody who probably really needs it and taking away money from a system that needs that money as well. So uh, I do think you'll see some positive movement in, in that direction. Now, as far as everything else, uh, I think you've seen the Attorney General's office You've seen some bills already pre-filed that are kind of pushing back on any sort of other reform. Uh, but I think we'll still talk about it though. Cause I mean, if I'm just the only person doing it that means somebody's talking about it. So um, uh, I'm gonna introduce legislation that deals with the parole board that deals with the death penalty um, and, and, and related topics. Okay. Let me also add Yes. Let me also add that uh, Chris uh, has made some very good points. And uh, I visited three of the correction facilities, uh, Cutwiler and uh, Ingram as well. And uh, it's, it's not a very pretty sight to see. But uh, recently, as you may recall, we had a, a prison release program set up. And uh, as you know, there was some blowback on that, which... I was once I was one of seven senators that voted against that piece because I felt like that uh, there wasn't much thought put into the piece of legislation that was passed. And uh, and although I do agree that, uh, like Chris alluded to uh, several times, is that there are certain individuals in our system that uh, have been had had served time, and uh, for some health reasons or whatever the case may be. We need to look carefully on how we can uh, ex those those individuals and send them home. Let let the relatives take care of them. And uh, so anyway, I uh, I do appreciate uh, the, the work is being done. Although the the new uh, prison site, uh, you know, the uh, site preparation has been has been completed, I think, and uh, construction will will start. Uh, pretty quickly and uh, although it's uh, a lot of questions yet to be be answered. So so I would like to to focus on a couple of other areas of criminal justice and DOC and those kinds of things in that um, you know one of the biggest things highlighted in the uh, federal court system as it's come through and, and the findings and those kinds of things is a staffing issues. Um, and I, I think that we have budgeted some dollars to increase uh, correction officer pay uh, to try to recruit and retain um, correction officers. I, I think that that's one of the things that we may not be able to quantify with new uh, facilities is the, the the ability to recruit uh, new officers uh, to to more secure locations, um, and so that's one of the things. And I know the state personnel board has that on their agenda for this next month uh, to kind of increase that that bottom end of uh, uh, correction officer pay, and uh, hopefully. I, I'm wanting to say at one time we were like 1,500 correction officers short. I think I saw something the other day that even our that that may have been the federal judge's estimate. I think even our estimate were about seven or eight hundred short. So um, 
we, we've got a ways to go and, and that number hasn't really changed. We're hiring left and right, but, but the, the, the net number is not changing much. So we've got to do something to kind of turn that around. And I want to just kind of add to that too. We, uh, there, uh, one thing that um, Kyle mentioned about staffing, the interesting thing about that is that we haven't had a net gain employment costs. We, we did what I think a couple of years ago increased uh, compensation for COs. We also created an additional position that's not um, a post certified or S certified, but can operate <clears throat> in like a, in a quasi capacity where they can't necessarily arrest, but they can also, but they can supervise, like they can operate certain um, within certain areas within, within our prison system and try to ease some of the, some of the um, lack of personnel. But interestingly enough, as our numbers have begun are dropping, the cost of uh, operating our prison system is still going up. Um, we, we, we are uh, bleeding money in that system. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting the Department of Corrections is unique. I think every single agency that came before the general fund this year is asking for an additional appropriation. But there really isn't any connection or correlation between a, a cost increase in the Department of Corrections and any better result. And I think uh, as we watch uh, conditions continue, continue to worsen, staffing levels continue to drop, uh, and also we still have a significant issue with, cult with a, a culture of corruption within the facilities where we still have a significant drug problem that is proliferating throughout the system. It's still violent, it's still dangerous. We still lack mental health care. Uh, we, we've got to figure out a way uh, to take the dollars that we're spending and actually spend them in a more effective and efficient way to start addressing some of those issues. And, you know, Senator Allen mentioned that we're building a prison and we do, we have a site prepared, um, but we're still three to four years off of that of having a, a actual new facility built. So that means that we have to have some sort of plan uh, to deal with this crisis from now until they, they come online. Uh, because at some point our judges, the judge in the case, Judge Thompson is gonna ask us, you know, like what has changed since the last time we talked? And if we don't have an answer better than we're just kind of sitting here waiting on prisons to be built, we're likely going to end up in a receivership where the judge decides, okay, if you can't do it, then I'm going to have to. And that's going to be prohibitively expensive. And is the new prison adding beds or are they just new yeah. beds? Right. So it's, that won't help with overcrowding or. It's a, it's a net like kind of level deal. But I, th I think a point to make back to, to Chris's points is, you know, we're paying more for less people now on the, the staffing side. And a lot of that is built in and overtime. I mean, um, if, we, if we could truly staff to the levels that we need to, we, it's hard to think about it. We may even save some money. So, um, but, but that, and, and one of the topics and points that we were making this week in, in budget hearings was we're not alone in this. Uh, you know, all of our surrounding states are kind of facing this same staffing crisis. Uh, Texas and, and Florida particularly have done some unique things that we may uh, take a deep look at uh, as far as trying to get those staffing levels back up. Um, and I, I think that's a, a big step in the right direction as far as uh, getting our, 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 you know, corrections under control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Mr. McCampbell? Do you yeah, I think on a positive note, uh, one of the things that I did here in, in budget hearings is we are, are now having a lot of, a lot of re having more rehabilitative uh, efforts going on in the Department of Corrections. Uh, I know the they are graduating their first class from the uh, Perry County uh, facility. And that facility is designed to take the 
people that really don't need to be in jail, they, but they need, uh, they need to, to be supervised, I guess, would be more of a correct way of putting it. That uh, facility, as well as some uh, other community facilities, are starting to have pay some dividends as well in terms of uh, getting people back out into the community with skills and uh, cutting down on the recidivism rate. Okay, great. Representative Allman, do you have anything? Yeah, to just a couple of things. Um, I, I have been to, uh, I can think of four prisons I've been in. I, back in the day, I used to be an attorney in the public defender's office. And prior to that, I did some criminal appointment work. Uh, so unfortunately, some of my clients uh, went, on to, went on to prison and, and I would subsequently visit them there uh, dealing with follow-up issues. So I have been to uh, several prisons. It's been a minute. Um, I have not seen a parole hearing or, or, or visited that. Uh, on a little bit different note in terms of criminal justice, um, the city of Tuscaloosa has asked our local uh, legislative delegation to support uh, its bill to allow the local police and fire uh, pension board to convert uh, from a privately funded and managed fund to one that would be managed by the retirement systems of Alabama. And so um, I expect we'll be following that bill soon here. and. Um, Think that I think our local delegation is all in favor of allowing them to do that. So that will be something that will hopefully happen soon and then they can get started on all that that entails in terms of conver conversion. But that will be something locally that will be happening. So I assume they, they hope that will help with retention? Yes. Yeah. Probably. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Okay. Great. Thank you for that. Um, anything else? Any last comment on criminal justice or have we driven that into the ground? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to be on the Judiciary Committee this year and uh, Representative England also is on that committee. I expect I'll be learning a whole lot more about the criminal justice issues our, face, our state faces after listening to him week after week. You say that now. <laughs> Great. Well, we look forward to hearing what what is to come on that. Um, all right, let's pivot to health care issues in Alabama. Um, again, we have Medicaid expansion. Um, is there an update on the status of that? If, is Why don't we rename that? It's called uh, Comprehensive, Comprehensive Health Care Initiative. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like it. I, I, and, and I think we're making progress towards it, to be honest with you. Really? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting to see what my colleagues say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that uh, intro there, Chris. <laughs> um, now, I, I, I think there, there, there is conversation taking place, and I don't think that that conversation has ever really stopped. I think it may be a new conversation now in that uh, it, there's a potential of, of maybe seeing Alabama's version of what Medicaid expansion looks like. Or, uh, and and to, to AJ's point, I think it's going to be labeled as something else. Uh, but uh, we, we talk about this every time uh, and have – ever since Medicaid expansion was, was a thing is in Alabama, it's a constitutional issue. And this will be something that has to go to the people of the state because all of the money that is created to pay for Medicaid expansion comes to us in the way of sales, use tax and income tax. Um, and those are all uh, earmarked for education in the state of Alabama. So there's no way to get it from this basket over into this basket to actually pay for the services. So um, I, I think there may be some unique ways that we could could look at that. But but again, it's going to be the, the people of the state uh, deciding that that's 
the, the route that they want to go. And uh, um, I, there, there's a lot of conversation going on in and around that. And I, I think also in addition to that, there, there is a lot of targeted investment um, in healthcare in general, uh, whether it be mental health, um, AJ and I sat through a meeting yesterday where, um, and, and Gerald too, uh, where there's a lot of targeted investment with some of these additional dollars that we have this year uh, in in those mental health areas and, and healthcare kind of as in general. So um, I, I think we're gonna make some progress this year. I'm not sure that the, the Medicaid expansion conversation will will mature to that level yet um but it it hasn't gone away for sure so the, the medicaid the, the medicaid program that that we are involved in today we have 1.3 million citizens of alabama that's getting some form of health care uh from the, our current program so it's it's uh it's one that uh from like Kyle mentioned, that there's some tweaking and there's some things that probably we need to do and, and do better. But uh, there's there's some certain things that you just got to be very conscious about, and, and that is is that currently we're, we are serving 1.3 million citizens out of a, a, about a 5.2 million uh, citizens of Alabama. So so we are serving those needs, and uh, and certainly uh, our would have to agree with uh, Chris and Cal that there may be one or two things that we can do differently, but uh, it's a good program currently. Well, I and I, wanna... I think an another point re real quick uh, um, is, you know, one of, one of the biggest uh, increases in the general fund, both within mental health and Medicaid this year is going to be the, the change in the FMAP. So we're going back to pre-pandemic levels in our FMAP match, which is going to take a lot of those additional dollars that we have right now um, in, in the general fund. So we, you know, to, to me, that's just sustaining what we've got, but it, you know, just in the general fund, that's an additional $70 million just by itself, just to keep it where it's at going back to pre-pandemic levels. So for those who don't know, what is FMAP? That is the percentage of state match to the federal Medicaid program. Okay. So, so it, it and, and on paper, it doesn't look like a big deal because it's changing, it's increasing back by a percent, percent and a half, two percent, somewhere in that general area. Uh, but when you talk about the the, the size and scope of Medicaid that ends up this year are representing about seventy million dollars. Okay. I do want to point out though that that there are industry members, hospitals, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and many others that are in the healthcare business that are are working hard to try to help us fashion a way to do it in the most cost effective way possible. Um, so, um, and that's why I felt like we do have some positive movement in that direction um, because obviously anytime you're going to do something like that, you're trying to find the best way to, to minimize the impact on the general fund while getting the biggest bang for your buck. Right. So if we can uh, minimize how much it's going to cost us, we'll get to a point where um, it won't be when it comes, becomes most cost effective, it'll be hard to say no at some point now. Uh, but I, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not being ridiculous here. I do understand that there is a cost associated with it. But in, in certain respects, over the last four or five years, Alabama has expanded Medicaid um, for children um, and so forth. So we have uh, made more people eligible for it and covered them. Um, so it's not a foreign concept to us. Um, I think it's really just getting to a point where everyone is comfortable with the number. And hopefully that'll happen um, really soon. Um, and again, we've got buy-in because a, a lot of our doctors and hospitals, uh, you know, they don't really like giving all this uncompensated care and Medicaid is one way to, to, to make that. Although it doesn't pay a lot in terms of how much the cost of the care is, 
it's something versus nothing. So uh, the other thing is that uh, we don't have that uncompensated care. It's passed on to you and I uh, and anybody else that has uh, private in private or group insurance policies. Yeah. So it will. Uh, somebody's paying for it. So. Hey, Again. Chris. Uh, well, Chris, uh, uh, Kyle, uh, Cynthia may, may help us on this one. Was that $8 billion from the feds that helped fund Alabama Medicaid? Did, did y'all see that number this morning or yesterday? Was it $8 billion that, that Alabama got? Mm, I hadn't heard that one. I didn't see it. Well, yeah. Listen, I mean, you know, the, kind of the, the breakdown of the general fund, you know, everything that comes into the general fund in, in totality is around $20 billion a year. Uh, we only appropriate uh, a little over two and a half billion of that. So, um, you know, what we refer to as middle column money that goes directly to mental health or directly to Medicaid and those kinds of things that we really have control over. Uh, Gerald, it, it, it could be that number because, about 65% uh, uh, of everything we allocate through the general fund is prisons and uh, Medicaid. So uh, we, we don't have a lot of, of dollars that are unencumbered to, to uh, provide all the other services of the state uh, beyond just those two big ticket items. Well, if you got $8 billion, uh, Jerry, you let us know where that, you, where that money is. Oh man, yeah, I understand that, Chris. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so you said that any, I think you said any additional funding for Medicaid is a constitutional issue. So, and, so what? what yeah. So, what, can you kind of explain? Yeah, the yeah. Process? Just general. I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but yeah. I'm curious, sort of, how that would play so, out. So, when when we talk about Medicaid expansion and all the dollars that that the the groups will say would come to the state in the way of uh, to to pay for it to offset the cost of it, uh, all of those would be increases in in a lot of staffing in places. Um, those kinds of things, which in turn for the state means uh, tax dollars in the way of sales and use tax and mainly income tax. And, and so they, they say basically if you're getting an extra $2 billion a year for health care, then that's going to matriculate it through back through the system and create new tax dollars. Well, those tax dollars in Alabama, unlike any other state, are constitutionally bound to be spent only in education. And so, therefore, we would have to unearmark those dollars to be able to transfer them over to the general fund to pay for those services. Okay. So, is that so? Then, to make that happen, would that be a constitutional amendment that would go to vote? That, the- that's correct. Yep. Okay. So, so the bill would go through the the legislature like a normal bill, probably, and. and there's obviously multiple ways to look at it, but at, at some point, in my opinion, you would have to get a constitutional amendment to the people of the state and, and allow them to vote on it. Okay. Any differing views on that? Any additional comments, thoughts on yeah. how that works? Yeah, let me, let me just add, uh, you know, on, on top of what Kyle was speaking of is that there's going to be some cost involved. So there's going to be uh, uh, a new, Another funding source has got to be developed to pay for that as well. Okay. All right. So um, piggybacking on healthcare, and you touched on it a little bit, but um, mental health specifically. And as you know, Tuscaloosa, um, we have a large mental health institution here. Um, What, if any, plans are there to strengthen and expand the mental health care in Alabama? You know, are there any specifics um, that you see coming? 
So I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, the uh, So previous administration, <laughs> lack, of, lack of foresight, created a lot of opportunity for us to repair a lot of the problems that were created when we just unilaterally shut down facilities across the state. So one of the more positive things that the state of Alabama has done recently is cre recreate crisis centers. Um, spent a good bit of money um, on, uh, I think Tuscaloosa got, is getting a crisis center. If we haven't already got one, in Birmingham is getting one. I think there's one in North Alabama that's coming. So um, we're actually repairing a lot of the damage that was done under the Bentley administration specifically uh, to uh, create crisis intervention centers where, you know, uh, one of the major gaps in our, in, our cover, in, our, in our coverage was, you know, if you had an immediate need, there was really nowhere else for you to go. So like in Tuscaloosa County, you would end up in, in, in North Harbor, uh, where, you know, likely likelihood is, or actually you probably may even end up arrested where you'd be in a situation where you were not getting treated, you were just getting stabilized. And by the time you got released, you'd just be worse. So you got a crisis center that would actually treat you, help you uh, sustain care, so you don't have to, you don't relapse, which is one of the major issues that we've had across this across the state, specifically here for a long time. And also, uh, Representative Allman mentioned in a local bill that we've got. Another one is to create a, a fund where we're going to divert a little bit of money from our municipal court to dedicate it to more mental health care too. Um, I mean, so City Tuscaloosa is actually doing a fantastic job in terms of trying to find different ways to take care of those that are uh, suffering from a mental health uh, issue, crisis, or so forth. So, um, but we do have another problem that's, it's, um, I mean, overwhelming our system, and that is compensating um, grouping home, group homes uh, in, in increasing the, um, the, uh, their rates so they can it, it pay their employees and also maintain some overhead. Um, we're losing group homes uh, because it's just not lucrative to do it anymore. Um, it costs way more than the state gives. So uh, we're gonna, and, and we've had several people approach delegation members about increasing those, those numbers. Um, I think Kyle has, has a little bit more information on that because we, we've talked at length about that here recently. Yeah, so, uh, that, that I think again back to the points that we were talking earlier, a huge staffing crisis when it comes to mental health, but it's up and down the the the, the line too. So it's from the top end all the way down to the bottom. And um, Chris was speaking about those reimbursements rates for for group homes that are providing ID and DV services. Um, they, they had had a step up during COVID as well from federal funds that, that increased those rates. And, and basically what we were being told is we, we are barely sustaining at the, that level. If we go back to pre-COVID rates, uh, you know, we're out of business. Uh, we, we can't take care of those most vulnerable citizens. So I think there's gonna be a huge push. It was in the budget request for mental health yesterday. Um, you know, to increase those even beyond um, that that COVID rate that that the federal guidelines set. So uh, I think that will be a big investment. Um, there, there is significant investment being made over at Taylor Harden here in town um, to to finish uh, the the expansion over there. Um, Chris said that I think we're on our fifth or sixth crisis center. They've kind of set those up regionally so far, uh, but I think there's additional ones to come. The, the one in Tuscaloosa is um, uh, kind of sponsored or, or uh, Indian Rivers is handling that um, situation over there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the, the state will build the facility and then Indian Rivers will, will manage it. So um, big time focus on that um, because as we talk about whether it be Medicaid or prisons or every time we talk about one of those issues, mental health comes up in the conversation. So um, I think that the focus has shifted over there um, and, and we're at the forefront of it, unfortunately, within the delegation here, because uh, if, if there's such thing as a mental health capital of the state, it's here because we had all the facilities here at one time. Yeah. 
Okay. Also, let me add, let me say uh, say this as well, uh, on top of what Chris and Kyle have mentioned as well, is that just, yesterday's uh, budget hearings, we've heard that uh, uh, Pickens County Hospital that was closed, uh, we're working and trying to get the funding uh, to refit that facility for adolescents and, and children. Uh, because right now the, the Children's Hospital in Birmingham has a waiting list for mental mental uh, disorders and for children and adolescents. So we're we're <clears throat> hoping that we can fulfill that uh, that uh, need in, in the coming uh, weeks. That uh, you can see some positive uh, uh, things from that development with that facility in Dickens County. So that's going to be a positive thing. And and kind of piggybacking off that too, Chris, help Absolutely. help me here a little bit. Um, there there was a, a waiting list of almost four thousand people uh, just three or four years ago waiting for services within the state. That number is down to uh, around fifteen hundred. So significant progress over the, I think that that was within a three-year period. Good. Okay. Um, so we're getting close to the end. Um, I'm sure you're all happy about that. <laughs> Get on with your evenings. But um, another area we wanted to touch on is the digital divide in Alabama. And what can be done to help close that that gap? Is there any um, budget surplus money that can be used for that? You know, do you have any plans to help improve this this huge gap that we have that really, you know, it it impacts people in all areas of their lives, right? Education, medicine, you know, if you don't have access to good internet, you're really, out of luck in so many other areas. So that's why we can't see AJ tonight. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, AJ, AJ is probably holding an antenna at a, a satellite <laughs> in the hand right now. I, I, I well, hate to joke well, about it, but you're 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 one hundred percent correct. Uh, there there are all sorts of uh, you know problems that we have in the state. I think there's been some consultants for the state that have estimated that somewhere between a four and six billion dollar problem. Um, we have made significant investments in it. Uh, some of those that are just now kind of being realized. Uh, over the last several years, whether it be ARPA-1 or uh, I, I think you will see a, a big push for that in ARPA-2, uh, having another investment, but also the Federal Infrastructure Fund uh, allowed us to, to sink a lot of money in that. And uh, um, so, yes, we're making strides, but it's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, he must have, he must have moved into a, a a sweet spot in the house. <laughs> I, would, I would have you to know that I I have just come <laughs> off the road, and uh, so now you can see me. It's, you weren't going to going to see me otherwise. We we had a we had a debate several years ago when when one of the broadband uh, initiatives came before the legislature, and uh, it. I, I probably won't get this quote exactly right, but AJ went to the microphone and said, y'all talking about all this 5G stuff and, you know, next generation stuff. He said, we're just looking for AG. <laughs> well, and we're still say, looking for AG too. <laughs> but right now though, yeah. uh, and, and I think Kyle alluded to it, there's a, a rather large pot of federal money that's been dedicated to building out broadband infrastructure and, several places across the country and Alabama is probably close to getting uh, it's going to get a billion or so dollars uh, going forward to uh, put some fiber in the ground in different places it's a huge but I mean the problem isn't necessarily the resources as much as it is how you get to how you get the resources to people to get to who are going to actually put this put the fiber in the ground and build out the broadband that's really a major issue because Again, you're still talking about a private business that has to go into these rural areas. Uh, and, and sometimes those costs are just unsustainable because like you can't, 
that last mile to get to people's houses if there's not a, a large number of people that you're serving there, it's almost, you almost lose money when you do it. So it's not necessarily the, the resources as much as it is how you get it to the folks and then making it worth their while too. Well, not- let me, let me, let me add as well that uh, the citizens of Alabama voted in the last election, November the 9th on the constitutional amendment, uh, uh, yeah. giving uh, uh, private companies to, to uh, get involved with, with public monies. And uh, that, I think that will go a long, long way with, with that as well, getting private investments involved and to, to do this call. Like Kyle mentioned a moment ago, that is a huge, huge amount of money when you start looking at covering every corner of this state. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a major task. And certainly I think we have, have made great strides in it. I think the, the next uh, billion, billion uh, dollars uh, that's coming up in the, in the – I'm not real sure if we're going to have a special session or not, Kyle, uh, Chris, uh, Cynthia, but, but uh, I would – I'm thinking that that may be, that may be uh, uh, a, a chance that we can uh, push broadband. Of, of course, water and sewer and health care is going to be involved in that discussion as well. So uh, we're we're on the right track to to uh, provide uh, broadband services to to rural Alabama. That's important. Here, so, here I go slapping slapping backs again. But uh, I, I think during my tenure in the legislature, that may be one of the biggest accomplishments we've made. Uh, in that we already had a a mechanism in place when all these money started flowing in 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 order to distribute these funds and 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 we were well on our way uh to to providing those services then now we were doing it with 30 million dollars a year uh at that time but we had already set up the 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 process by which we were going to do that so we were ahead of the game ahead of most states Uh, when it came to that. And then as these federal dollars started flowing in, whether it be from ARPA, COVID, or um, federal infrastructure dollars, um, we we were ahead of the game, well ahead of our peers. So there's a a map on the the internet. You can go to the ADECA website and see a map and and see see the progress that that Cal has alluded to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can all go check your internet except AJ. <laughs> <laughs> so is there um, money that would allow for more innovative solutions, you know, thinking about sort of that last mile and how hard it is to get get it to people where they're at instead of fiber using like a satellite network or something like that? Or does it have, to, you know, is that considered infrastructure? Or does it actually have to be like just fiber or something? So, so right now, to to that point, it it is uh, pretty much a, a hard line that that they've kind of wrapped their head around. Now, I I would like to push for it to be uh, technology neutral, no, no matter what that technology is. You know, um, I hate to keep making fun of AJ, but you know, the the most basic form of broadband is cell service. And we still have places in the state where you can't make a cell call. Uh, We've got schools that you can go into that there is no way you can get a cell signal in there. Uh, Not only is that a health and safety issue, but it's the most basic form of broadband. And and I think if we're forward looking enough, uh, 20 years from now, we may not need that line into the home because everything may be wireless. So I, I think we've got to broaden the scope of that as we move forward. Uh, but like I said, just just the wired portion of that is a four to six billion dollar problem. So uh, I, I we, we will definitely having those conversations, but I don't know exactly what that looks like. Whether it is to incentivize, um, you know, satellite uh services or those kinds of things it becomes a little bit harder when you're not building actual infrastructure hey uh, cal did did ken boswell answer a question yesterday concerning satellite uh he was asked and said they were considering all options so i i don't i don't think they've honed in again it's it's not easy because they can't just 
invest in the infrastructure. Um, so right. so there, there's an ongoing expense to, you know, whether it to make it affordable or, you know, however that is, because satellite satellites more expensive. Um, it, it's becoming a better quality service. It's not quite to the level that everything else is wired wise, um, but but it's awfully expensive. Okay, to wrap up. Let, um, let, let, let me say, let me say yes. something here uh, uh, concerning our delegation. Uh, we have uh, three state senators and seven House members. And, uh, and I'll put our group uh, in Tuscaloosa, who represents Tuscaloosa County, West Alabama, against any other delegation in this state. And uh, we, we've got some quality individuals, and I, I appreciate each one of them uh, very, very much. So, I don't know about those uh, new guys, though. They're not here tonight, so we can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, I and all, all of the league members really appreciate your attendance um, every year. You're very faithful, and we appreciate that. And you all seem to work well together. Um, we have had others comment to us that um, they are amazed that we can hold this event that, <laughs> that they only wish they could get their delegations to do the same thing. So I, I really appreciate that. I can um, sell tickets to Jefferson County. One. <laughs> <laughs> so as we wrap up, you know, we talk about these issues again every year and we have these questions, but what do you see being different this year? So, you know, the voters often are disenfranchised, I feel, because they don't really see things happening, I, you know, from the legislature. It's kind of the same thing. You pass the budget, you know, they don't really know what goes on. And so what do you see is going to be new or different this year that could help voters, you know, connect? perhaps. Mm. And I'll, I'll start with Senator Allen. Well, actually, it's uh, that's, a, that's a good question, but I, I do think that the, the citizens of Alabama, you know, and there's, you know, just to encourage your, your group and your organization. In my 29 years, I've, I've missed one, one of this, one of these uh, annual meetings, and uh, and your group, if if all Alabamians had the heart and uh, and the background and knowledge as your group and your your members, then uh, then that question that you asked would would I, I would be thinking to be obsolete, you know. I, but I I wish people would engage with their elected officials, you know, from the school board on to the to the uh, public safety officials, to the county elected officials, to uh, the state house officials, to Congress, and, and to the White House. You know, I, and because we, uh, I would have to say there is a disconnect uh, among some. Uh, I would have to agree with that. But, but at the same time, it's uh, um, uh, uh, you know being able to communicate, be able to to see. What's taking place on the Senate floor, the House floor? It's on. It's on live stream. You can you can be involved with that, and uh, and at the same time, uh, the the numbers of the State House is is uh, uh, there for anyone to make a call, and uh, and that's important. And in fact, uh, I would love to give you my number right now. It's three three four two six one zero eight six one in Montgomery. And I, I would encourage men and women uh, of all ages, tough listen in, in this state, to, to be active, be involved, ask those questions. So, Representative Almond, what do you um, see as perhaps being different this session from others? Well, this is my first session, so the whole thing will be different for me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my second. I was there last year, but... 
But I have, of course, served on the Tuscaloosa City Council for, uh, or did for 16 years, so I'm not new to politics. And I would echo what Gerald has just said, and that is um, kudos to you and your organization here uh, tonight for taking the time to put this on and work through all the difficult te technological challenges, um, and, because it is important to um, be able to uh, help people find different ways to connect and to learn and to be engaged. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all on us as individuals to be engaged and to be interested enough to, to dive into the issues and to learn for ourselves. I encourage people to uh, you know, not just read the headlines, but to, to sort of follow things along throughout the year to really get the bigger picture of what's going. There's so, so much going on just in Montgomery, and it is really hard to wrap your head around. Uh, trust me, that's where I am right now. Uh, we have a third of the house are brand new uh, house members, and the year that the four years before that was another third. So I think about two thirds of the house of representatives have been serving four years or less, and I think that presents some some challenges. I mean, some, some great opportunities for new new idea, new new ideas, new blood, uh, but also some challenges for um, just sort of having people there who have some um, longevity and some some knowledge as as these gentlemen here tonight do, and you can hear that just having been there a while, takes a while to, to really um, start to understand all the things that are going on. So thank you for hosting tonight. I think it's, um, I've learned a lot. I'll just say that. All right, Representative McCampbell. Uh, I too thank you for the, the hosting of tonight. And I, I also echo the desire that people really, if we could get all of our citizens to uh, be engaged in the process, then uh, we'd have a more informed citizenry. And, um, you know, I think we would then be able to move more in a direction that uh, the people really want us to go. Uh, so, what do I see happening different this year? I don't know. I, I would hope that with all the technology, uh, somehow we could engage more with the public uh, in a manner that would, would allow them to actually be involved in, in if not just a daily process, but the weekly at least the weekly process throughout the session. So I, I would hope we'd have some people that would actually take time and learn how to tune in and hear what we are, are doing in Montgomery. Okay, Representative Sal. Did, did I hear AJ say he wanted to build a new state house? Uh, I heard it. I maybe heard I was hearing it. something. I did hear that. <laughs> uh, no, what what you did here was I need a G. <laughs> um, no, I, I I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you guys each and every year. Uh, I think this is my ninth, eighth or ninth time to be able to to come and join this forum. Um, you know the the engagement that everybody's kind of talked about. Uh, makes our job easier when we get to Montgomery. So it's it's not a uh, a reactive kind of thing. If we the the more engagement we get, we can kind of uh, get it out in front of some issues and those kinds of things. And and I, I think you know um, we we are serving in a relationship business, and I, I think sometimes unfairly, uh, especially within the delegation, but it in the body as a whole. Um, you know, because of the politics in Washington, D.C., uh, everybody just assumes that it's that way in Montgomery. And I, I will be the first to say that uh, a lot of work goes into the building those relationships across the aisle. Uh, I think more could be done. Um, and, and if we can get to that point where we can interact with each other more, um, things would go a lot smoother. And, and I think we've made some progress, but we've got a little ways to go. And um, so that's what I would like to see uh, as we move forward is, you know, us being able to interact with each other more on a on a personal basis 
get to know each other better. And, and I think that makes the political process a whole lot easier and better as well. Okay. And Representative England. Yeah, I'll just echo everyone's sentiment. Um, <clears throat> I think I got like a 14 year streak going uh, <laughs> on, on, on this event. Um, this is a, uh, this is one of those events that I make sure that I, I, I attend. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I really enjoy, and I also enjoy the relationships that we have in our Tuscaloosa delegation. Um, and it's interesting, uh, we've got uh, three new members this year, uh, Curtis Travis, Ron Bolton, and Bill Lamb. And I think they've integrated themselves rather seamlessly into our group. Um, and I think that's just a testament to the, to the, the fact that we're focused more uh, on the relationships that we've built versus the partisanship and everything. As when it comes to Tuscaloosa issues, we're generally focused on fixing the problem when somebody approaches us about it. Um, and also, I just want to agree with everybody else. Also, I think the biggest challenge uh, going forward is going, is going to be uh, the new membership. Um, you know, Kyle alluded to it earlier. Um, just for an issue like gambling, for example, um, you, you you actually have to kind of start over from scratch to a certain degree because you've got to figure out uh, when you got a third of the legislature was brand new, you've got to completely start over and explain to those folks what how the process works. And because it's a constitutional amendment, they, they, they have to participate. So uh, I think the biggest challenge in, is, is going to be uh, figuring out who's who, who's what's what, what their issues are, and you know what kind of legislator they think they want to be and how they fit into the process. So um, uh, it's like Senator Allen said earlier, Gerald said earlier, uh, we've got a fantastic delegation, um, and I, I, every year when we come on, we come to this event, we get to display um, how how fantastic we are <laughs> um, because trust me when I tell you uh, there are other delegations that do not get along at all. Uh, they fight about everything. And uh, even when we disagree on an issue, um, we are often, we oftentimes uh, know how to work through them and get to a solution. So, um, and I think our track record shows that. So uh, again, just like everybody else said, thank you for putting on this event and having us, and I'm, I'm looking forward to next year. Great, so thank you. And before we close, I have one, I guess I'll call it a public service announcement. Um, a couple of you uh, mentioned the uh, live streaming of sessions, and so I'm gonna try to get this right. So the League of Women Voters of Alabama has worked with, um, the legislature and um, is going to offer live streaming, the live streaming through Allison at the Alabama channel.org. And they will all be um, saved. So the live streams will be recorded, saved, and you'll be able to search them by keyword. So if you're looking for a specific bill when someone mentioned that, or if you're looking for when your representative spoke about something, you'll be able to search for that. It will come up. Um, so you all could maybe use it as well if you'd like to, you know, send mm -hmm. that out. Send I think it'll be good for everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but that is something that we have worked <laughs> to try to help promote transparency and to educate voters about what is happening during the session. So we'll start off with just some, um, some sessions and maybe committees, I'm not sure, being recorded um, and saved into the system. And then we hope to expand it going forward. So that's something we're very excited about, but it's the alabamachannel.org is the website you can go to to look for that. So thank you all. I really appreciate it. And good luck this session, and we will see you next year. <laughs>